Sprite Castle. Sprite Castle. Sprite Castle. Put your robo here. Sprite Castle. Well, hello and welcome to Sprite Castle, the show in which I play, discuss, and review Commodore 64 games. My name is Rob Flack O'Hara, and on this episode of Sprite Castle, I will be discussing Mr. Do. Now, here's a trivia question for you. Have you ever noticed anything unique about the design of the levels in Mr. Do? I will tell you what that Easter egg is later on in this show. But before we get started talking about this episode's game, let's check the Daily Sun for this week's Paperboy headlines. Welcome back to another episode of Sprite Castle. Uh, once again, I am recording this in one take as both a video and audio version. So if you enjoy uh, watching pictures and videos of the games and things like that, uh, here's a news flash: The show is moving to the Amigos Retro Gaming channel on YouTube. So go over to youtube.com forward slash Amigos Retro Gaming and you will find a playlist there for the Sprite Castle podcast. Now, what does that mean about the Sprite Castle channel that I just set up on YouTube? Well, it's still going to be there. Um, the You Don't Know Flack podcast is going to go there and all other sorts of videos. I've got some reviews coming up. I've got some just random takes on uh, toys and retro stuff. So in, any subscriptions to that channel are are not not for not. <laughs> if that makes sense. Uh, there's going to be con uh, content there as well. So really, the two things you want to check are YouTube.com forward slash Amigos Retro Gaming and YouTube.com forward slash Sprite Castle. Um. I don't think I got too much feedback from the previous episode. I'm trying to, I'm scanning through my list here. Um, and I don't think I had too much. That was a fun episode. That was uh, uh, Rocket Ball, which was the uh, um, uh, game that I played and talked about, you know. And I didn't, uh, uh, I hadn't seen the movie Rollerball before, but I have since watched that. It was a lot of fun. And uh, uh, so... You know, it just kind of you do have to watch it to uh, tie in with the game. If you're going to play the game, you should watch the movie. And and now I've done both, and uh, it all worked out. It was a lot of fun. So anyway, we're going to jump ahead to this episode's Kings of the Castle. Well, the last episode I played Rollerball and, uh, no, Rocket Ball is the game. Rollerball is the movie. Rocket Ball is the game. And the song was Rocket Queen from Guns N' Roses. So congratulations to Edward Smith, Paul Marfleet, Bill Spear, and Dave Zilly. I think those are the only people that have been hanging out in the VIP room since the last episode, uh, which is actually kind of good because uh, we got Guns N' Roses to be the in-house band for the past two weeks, and they have destroyed the place. Worse than any of the VIPs ever had. I mean, uh, the toilets clogged, Axel ate all the snacks, slash broke everything. I mean, it's just a mess. So, uh, you know, with not too many people going in and out of the VIP room, that has given us uh, a little bit of time to fix things up and uh, get the room presentable for the next episode. So, uh, you know the drill. At the end of the episode, you will hear an 8-bit song that is related to the theme of the show, but is not from the game itself. If you can identify that song, shoot me an email at robohara at robohara.com and put King of the Castle in the subject line, and uh, Gmail will pluck that out of... <laughs> Any potential junk folders or spam folders and put it right there in my inbox where I can see it. Uh, and uh, you will get your own personalized key to the VIP room where you can party with all of the episodes Kings of the Castle. Uh, I don't have any questions. I didn't get any questions submitted for this uh, week's episode. But if you are a 16-bit supporter on Patreon, you can send me a Commodore-related question, and I will answer it on Sprite Castle. So uh, that's always fun. Uh, if you have any feedback about this or any episode of the show, you can always email me directly at robohara at robohara.com. 
Join the conversation on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash robcast. Follow me on Twitter at Commodore. Come chat with me on the Amigos Retro Gaming Discord or leave me a message on the podcast hotline, which is area code 405-486-YDKF. Uh, also, don't forget that all Patreon supporters get access to the Amigos Discord server, which is home to several podcast communities, including the Amigos, ARG Presents, Pixel Guide In, and the TeamSpeak Irregulars. Uh, if you want to go see what all benefits you get for supporting the show, and I say this every week and I mean it, uh, this show would not be possible without the people supporting this show on Patreon. It's Things are get more expensive <laughs> over time. You've got hosting fees, hardware fees as you're looking to expand the show, make things better. Uh, it's uh, You definitely do put some money back into the hobby. And so the Patreon people are the ones that keep the wheels moving forward. So if you want to go uh, watch behind the scene videos and blog posts and all sorts of things like that, go to patreon.com forward slash Rob O'Hara and go see what's going on over there. This episode of Sprite Castle is proudly sponsored by Retro Rewind. For all your Commodore bits, bytes, and accessories, go visit Retro Rewind at retrorewind.ca forward slash Sprite Castle. Uh, when you check out, don't forget to use Sprite Castle to get a 10% discount on all orders. And I just noticed over the past week, uh, Retro Rewind, or the past couple of weeks, they have added... Um, a recapping service. So if you have an old Amiga computer, Commodore 64, uh, the CD32 I know is pretty ripe uh, for recapping. If you have one of those old machines and uh, you know it's not uh, acting up to snuff or you've purchased an old one and you don't know the history or you're having issues with it, recapping can do wonders for old hardware. So go over to Retro Rewind and check out their new recapping service uh, that they are offering. And those are this week's headlines brought to you by my local paper boy who just ran over my trash can. Okay, now I'm mad. Now that we're done discussing this week's news, let's discuss this week's snack. Crack, crack, crack the egg into the bowl. Crack, crack, crack the egg into the bowl. Talking snack. You know, again, and I say this on a lot of episodes, there are games that don't uh, feature any food or edible items at all. And if I don't have a story or there's nothing in the game that reminds me of food, sometimes those can be difficult to do. Uh, but Mr. Do does feature two different types of food. It features cherries and it features apples. And I debated as I started playing this game, what am I going to cover? Am I going to cover something related to cherries? Am I going to, you know, do something related to apples? And I kind of just bounced back and forth. Cherries or apples? Apples or cherries? And then a memory hit me that involves both apples and cherries. And those are dessert pizzas. And very specifically, I'm going to talk about the dessert which is a trademarked name by the company Pizza Inn. Now, Pizza Inn is a pizza chain. I know they have a lot of them here in the Southwest. Um, they've, they've mostly dried up. I know uh, all the ones that I personally worked at are long gone. There was one that opened recently, I say recently, like five years ago near my work, and it is now, I believe, closed up. So Pizza Inn, I don't know if they are uh, a thing of the fa of the past or if this is uh, uh, just due to to covid and maybe they'll be coming you know making a comeback in the near future but um one of the things that uh pizza in well a lot of pizza chains uh, struggled with were desserts. People ordered, uh, you know, appetizers. A lot of pizza chains had breadsticks or garlic bread, things like that. And of course, they have lots of pizzas to choose from, but not a lot of pizza chains had desserts. And different places experimented with different things. I know uh, when I worked at Mazio's, we had cinnamon sticks which were kind of like breadsticks, except for they had a, a cinnamon sauce on them and powdered sugar. And, and uh, some of the other places have different desserts. But uh, Pizza Inn was the first place I ever saw that had a dessert pizza, which was actually called the Pizzert. 
And if you look up Pizzert, if you Google Pizzert, a pizza in will come up. That is a trademark term. That is their official term uh, for dessert pizzas. Now, I worked at Pizza Inn, and like a lot of pizza chains, if you worked there for more than, um, you know, I only worked at Pizza Inn for maybe a year, but I worked at three different locations. Uh, there was a, a location that needed help running their buffet for a while, and so they sent me to work over there, and then there was another location that needed a delivery driver, so they sent me over there. So I worked at a lot of different uh, Pizza Inns, but uh, at, at all the pizza inns I worked at, I made pizza. That was <laughs> mostly what I did. Uh, I, I worked as a, a shift manager and I made pizza. And part of that for the buffet mostly was making desserts. Now, a dessert starts off with a regular pizza crust, like a thin pizza crust. And then instead of marinara or pizza sauce, it gets basically cake batter. And so you would go into, we had a big walk-in freezer and you would get us the spoon and you would dip and put cake batter on this pizza crust and, you know, kind of smooth it around. And then once that was on there, we had these big buckets that probably came from Sam's. <laughs> I don't know, uh, but they were basically pie filler. If you've ever seen that pre-made uh, pie filler that just feels like, I mean, it's like, um, this weird kind of jelly consistency, and then it has, you know, pieces of fruit floating in it, like cherries or or apples. And the third kind that we made was chocolate chip. And so you would take uh, a spoon and sit there and, and scoop out, you know, 20 cherries or however many, whatever the recipe was, and put those onto the cake batter. And once that was done, you put it in the pizza and baked it just like a normal pizza. And so the, the cake batter would rise just enough, you know, to where it was kind of cakey on top, but you got that pizza crust underneath so it still felt like a pizza. And then you had delicious cherry or, or delicious apple or, or the uh, the chocolate chip ones weren't bad either, but there are no chocolate chips, obviously, and Mr. Do, but there are cherries and apples. Um, I can tell you now also, uh, I forgot to mention when they came out, the other thing you would do is there was a dipping spoon that had holes in it and there was a um, plastic tub of uh, icing and you would scoop that out and then just kind of sprinkle that around the top and the icing would kind of drip, you know, in this uh, pattern around the top. And that would be the, the coup de gras of the dessert. Now, uh, when I worked at pizza Inn, it was, uh, my only job. Uh, I was going to school and pizza Inn was my only income. I believe I was making around $5 an hour. Uh, so I didn't have a lot of money for food or eating out or for much of anything, to be honest with you. So most of my meals came from Pizza Inn. And uh, so at, at night, <laughs> at the end of my shift, I would take a pizza home and eat on it. And then when I woke up in the morning, I would finish that pizza off and that would be breakfast. And then, you know, eventually I would uh, go to work <laughs> after school and I would eat while I was at work. And so I kind of just consisted, uh, my whole diet consisted of uh, pizza. And eventually I had a roommate, my buddy Andy, who I interviewed, uh, started on, uh, you, I interviewed him on You Don't Know Flack, not on Sprite Castle, but uh, he became my roommate and he worked at Pizza Hut. So he would bring home Pizza Hut pizza. <laughs> so we kind of just lived off of pizza and pizza products for about six months. But uh, it was, I, it was the, uh, you know, as the guy making pizzas, it was always my job to go in and make the desserts, which you only made when somebody ordered one, you know, they were too expensive to just throw out on the buffet all the time or, or just make them. Uh, but what I found is, uh, that cake batter was pretty good by itself. And so I started going in there and just, I had my own little spoon <laughs> and I would make up excuses to go into the walk-in and, and be like, Hey, I got to go count and see you know, how much cheese we got. And I'd go in there and I'd have my little spoon stashed on a uh, a wire shelf. And I'd reach back and I'd open up that cake batter and just take a couple of bites and be like, yum, 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 yum. Uh, and then later I would I would uh, switch it out. I was uh, constantly using clean silverware. And I would go in there and I would get some of the apples or the cherries and yum, yum, yum. And I would... <laughs> And I would eat it out. I was constantly just eating ingredients. <laughs> I, I remember making pepperoni pizzas and you would put down all however many pepperonis you were supposed to put down and then however many were left in my hand, I would just eat. Um, 
I never went hungry working at a pizza place. Uh, but anyway, so, you know, I, this was a really fun memory, seeing the uh, cherries and the apples uh, on this game. And, uh, uh, you know, th- the good thing I would say about the, uh, con- you know, the cherries and the apples on a dessert is that they never uh, hurt me or anyone, uh, which is not true. In the game, Mr. Do. Now, Mr. Do was published for the Commodore 64 in 1985 by Datasoft. It is a game for one or two players that uses joystick controls. Uh, the publisher for the game is Datasoft. Uh, we've covered other Datasoft games, so I'm not going to deep uh, dive into their history. They published games from 1981 to 1989. Some of the games you may be familiar with include Dig Dug, Alternate Reality, Conan, Zorro, and The NeverEnding Story. Uh, some of the other Datasoft games I have covered on Sprite Castle include Bruce Lee, which goes all the way back to episode number three, uh, Goonies, which was episode 18, and Mancopter, 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 which was episode number 45. Now, on Moby Games, they list the developer of the game as Universal. Universal is the company who made the original arcade version that this game is based on. Uh, Universal was in business from 1978 all the way through 2011. Uh, Some of the games that they made that were classics include uh, Space Panic, Galaxy Wars, and uh, Circus. Now, the reason they were in business through 2011 is because they moved on to make slot machines uh, or these type of coin uh, redemption games. And so that's what they've been doing in recent years. Um, But I don't think there are any other universal games that I have covered uh, on Sprite Castle. There are sometimes you will find information about the programmer of a game, and sometimes that leads to information, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, but this one was very interesting. Uh, the, uh, the man who wrote this game, his name, or that, that did the Commodore 64 version, uh, his name is Troy Linden. Now, on the uh, Moby Games, it says he was responsible for the game uh, Snokey, which is a game that I covered a long time ago. He did Time Runner. Um, He did Howard the Duck. So he did a lot of interesting games. But then I found his website, which is TroyLinden.com. And it runs through his entire history with uh, creating games. And this guy was basically legendary. I didn't realize this. Uh, He started off making several TRS-80 games as an early teenager. Uh, Based off of those games, he was hired by GameStar, which was purchased eventually by Activision. He was responsible for Star Rank Boxing. He did the Game Boy Advance 2-on-2 basketball. Again, he did Howard the Duck. He did ABC's Monday uh, Monday Night Football. He did Dream Team Basketball. And then he eventually got a deal. Uh, He was working for a very small company with two or three employees. And they got a deal with Capcom to convert uh, Capcom arcade coin-op games over to home computers. And so he worked on Street Fighter, uh, Speed Rumbler, Hat Trick, 1942, Bionic Commando, Ghosts and Goblins, Sidearms, and Tiger Road. Uh, His company worked on the first 3D Madden football game, and they also did NHL Hockey 94 for the Sega Genesis. I mean, there's so many games on this guy's resume that are all-time classics. I, it was just amazing uh, looking through his uh, resume. Uh, the latest things that he worked on is he did the Left Behind games that were based on the uh, series of Left Behind books. And uh, so that's the most recent projects that they've been working on. And actually his website's quite interesting. He does a lot of stuff uh, like motivational speaking and things uh, outside of video game development, but very, very uh, interesting career in regards to uh, video game creation. So the general description of Mr. Do, Mr. Do is described as a free-roaming maze game, which is similar to Dig Dug, in which Mr. Do must complete levels by either eating all of the cherries on a level or, uh, let's see, destroying all the monsters will in the level or gathering all the letters floating around to spell extra or, in some rare cases, finding a diamond. 
Uh, this was a port of an arcade game. The arcade game was developed by Universal and distributed by Taito. Uh, it was the first arcade game sold as a conversion kit. So if you remember in the early days of arcade games, if you had an arcade game and it wasn't making money, you had to sell that arcade game uh, and then replace it with an entirely new game. And so Mr. Do was the very, very first game that was sold as a conversion kit. So if you had another uh, JAMA type cabinet, you could just buy this swap the guts in and have a, a new game. And so that would only cost you a couple hundred dollars as opposed to a couple thousand dollars if you're buying uh, an entirely new game. Uh, in Japan, Mr. Do was one of the top 10 highest grossing arcade games of 1982. It was also a commercial success in North America. It sold approximately 30,000 arcade units in the United States. Part of that popularity is because of the availability of it being a conversion kit. Um, and then I always like when facts are listed in this format, it said it was among the 13 highest earning games of 1983. Well, I'm going to assume it was number 13. <laughs> I love it when things say it was in the top 13. Well, <laughs> why would you say, oh, it was number seven. <laughs> why would you say it that way? Um, so when it came to, to home ports, the rights were split. Uh, the uh, rights to develop versions for home uh, video game consoles went to Coleco. And so they released the port for the ColecoVision and for the Atari 2600. But uh, rights for home computer versions went to Datasoft. And so that is the version that we have here on the Commodore 64. Uh Let's see here. Uh, the uh, box. I've got the box here in front of me. Uh, it says uh, Mr. Do at the top. Of course, it says Datasoft. Um, Datasoft kind of had a unique look. They had this light blue boxes. Things were slightly at a uh, uh, just a little bit of an angle to set them apart. You've got a couple of the Mr. Do monsters surrounding Mr. Do. There's an apple dropping on one of their heads and the Powerball that Mr. Do throws is flying. So it shows off several uh, aspects of the game on the artwork. Uh, there are two different stickers explaining to customers that the Atari and Commodore, 60 ver Commodore 64 versions are both on the same floppy disk. And Datasoft actually did this with a lot of their releases. So, uh, you know, the front side would be the version for the Commodore 64 and the back side would be the version for Atari computers. Um, the uh, back just has a picture of the game, and then it shows a picture of the arcade cabinet. So they're trying to uh, let you know that this is a home version of a coin-op game. Then uh, there's some text on the back here, which kind of explains the game. It says, now as Mr. Do, you can harvest a high score on your own computer in this hit arcade game from Universal. Plot your course through a field ripe for picking. Pick the cherries and grab the delicious morsels for bonus points, but at your own risk. A hungry boss monster and his henchmen invade the field and chase you. Demolish them with your amazing powerball or quash them with giant apples. More excitement awaits you when mystery treats appear and the lucky diamond reveals a secret bonus. And then there's a list of special features. Endless screen combinations, strategic gameplay, Hours of fun and challenge with the arcade's favorite clown. You know, I hadn't really thought about this. I'm just off the top of my head, but I don't remember. You know, we had a, a kick, also known as Kick Man, and I believe that featured a clown, and I do believe that predates this. Um, I'm trying to think of any other. There was also Circus Charlie around this same era. I'm trying to think of any other games that might have featured clowns. So I don't know that they held a claim to the arcade's favorite clown, but uh, but they claimed it, so there you go. Uh, I also found some advertisements, and if you're looking at the video version, I've posted this ad from a magazine. Uh, their big thing was, it says, Datasoft, we challenge you, that their games were challenging, and it has a different piece of artwork, but done in the same style. And this has Mr. Do as he's getting ready to throw the Powerball. And you can see the monsters are running away. 
and the top says, has Mr. Do clowned around once too often? And it has uh, more or less a similar text explaining how the game works. Uh, so once you get to, uh, when you load this game on the Commodore 64, there is a brief title screen. Uh, it's really a loading screen. It is blue with white basic text. It says, Datasoft presents Mr. Do. Um, Datasoft says, uh, has a copyright symbol. Mr. Do has TM. <laughs> then it says, copyright 1984 by Universal USA. All rights reserved. Programmed by Troy Linden, 1985, by Datasoft Incorporated. Mr. Do is a trademark of Universal USA. But once the game starts loading, that goes away, and the eventual game pops up uh, to a menu screen. Now, the menu screen has uh, the extra bonus up at the top for some reason. I don't know why that's already there. It says Datasoft presents Mr. Do, and this time Mr. Do is in a big graphical uh, you know, a big giant picture that changes colors. So it cycles through uh, a bunch of different colors. Uh, again, it says program by Troy Linden. And then you have some buttons you can press on the menu here. You can press S to toggle the background music on or off. Uh, you can press L or R for player one. And then it says right handed. Uh, and then player two is shift L or R uh, for player two right-handed. So there was a thing for a short period of time where I don't know who came up with this idea, but that left-handed people were having trouble with Atari style joysticks that they wanted the button in the other corner. So a few games would allow you to rotate the joystick 90 degrees. And that's what this is doing. So you can press L or R for player one or shift L and R uh, for player two. And you can rotate the controls 90 degrees so that you can rotate your joystick 90 degrees. Now, uh, all that being said, I use a Epix uh, 500 XJ joystick. So uh, you really can't rotate that. <laughs> so it's all a big boot point for me. Uh, F3 toggles one or two players and uh, press a joystick button to start the game. Uh, so when the game begins, there's some different information that appears on the screen. First of all, it says uh, level one. You can see the background is made of grass. Uh, there is a partial path already dug through the grass. And then there are five different groups, and each one consists of eight cherries, and they are in a four by two uh, matrix is how they're they're laid out. Uh, and then you've got an apple, uh, maybe a couple of apples that are uh, suspended uh, just in, you know, in the maze. And those work kind of uh, very similar to the rocks uh, that are in Dig Dug. Uh, actually, there's three I'm looking at now. There are three apples uh, on the first level. There is a monster generator right in the very middle of the screen. And so that's where all the monsters come out of. And when the game begins, Mr. Do is at the bottom of the screen. Uh, so this does work like Dig Dug, where you can run through the path that is already established, or you can just basically go anywhere you want and make your own path. Now, the monsters, for the most part, this is not always true, but for the most part, stay inside the path. And so they will not free roam. Occasionally, they turn into little diggers, and they will start making their own path, but for the most part, they stay in the path that has already been established. Now, as I said, uh, what makes this game unique is that there are multiple ways to end the level. And the first one is you can get all the cherries. So again, there are uh, five different groups of eight cherries. And if you collect all the cherries, the level ends and you move to the next level. Uh, you can also kill all the creeps and that will end the level. There are two ways to kill the creeps. One is to shoot them with your power ball. Uh, the second is you can drop an apple on them. So that's basically the two ways to get rid of those. Um, also, letters can sometimes appear and those will be one of the five letters in the word extra. Uh, if you are able to shoot all five of those letters, that will end the level and you will get an extra man. And by the way, that is the only way 
to get an extra man in this game. You don't get extra men based on your score. You only get them by destroying the five letters uh, in extra. I believe those are referred to as alpha monsters, the alphabet letters that come around. Uh, the alpha monsters can also kill you, which is kind of a strange thing because your instinct is to run and get them. But no, they, <laughs> they will also kill you if you touch one. Uh, and then... Those apples that are scattered around that you can use to drop on your enemies' heads and squish them, very rarely when those apples fall and they will break open, sometimes there's a diamond inside. If you go get that diamond, it's worth a lot of points and uh, you will end the level and it will immediately go to the next level. So uh, lots of different ways to clear each level. Now your controls... Uh, you basically, you know, it's a joystick. You move your four directions and Mr. Do can run left, right, up or down. And the button fires your power ball. So you're holding onto this power ball. And uh, once you shoot it, it will stay inside uh, the, the path that has been dug. And uh, it will not, uh, either it has to hit something and explode or it will eventually bounce and come back to you. Uh, but you only have one power ball, so you can't shoot more than one at a time. And once you've shot that power ball, it either has to come back or destroy something before uh, you will get another one. Now, as the game goes, uh, not as the game goes on, but as the, you shoot more and more power balls, they take longer and longer to regenerate. So um, if you shoot a bad guy, it will, or a creep, the, the bad guys are called creeps. If you shoot a creep, uh, it will regenerate almost immediately. And the second time, it's also pretty quick. And then the third time, it takes like five or seven seconds, maybe longer before it comes back, which seems like a long time uh, when the creeps are chasing after you. So when it comes to gameplay strategy, the first thing you got to do is figure out how do you plan to beat the level. Uh, do you plan on getting all the cherries, um, you know, which, which is, uh, you know, perfectly acceptable. And, and so if that's your plan, you need to run away from the creeps and, and try to build these paths to uh, get the cherries in a specific order, which I'll, I'll talk about when we talk about scoring. Uh, basically, what you want to do is get all eight in a time. And each time you get one, uh, the note raises uh, one note. So it will go like do, 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 do. And it'll keep going up. And so when you get all eight, it's basically gone up an entire octave and you get uh, bonus points for doing that instead of just getting them, you know, two or three at a time. Uh, but anyway, so you can play the game that way or you can just decide from the very beginning that you're going to try to kill all the creeps and you can spend all your time digging tunnels and trying to drop apples uh, on uh, on top of the creeps. Uh, what I find is that you can make a plan and then as the action gets going, usually my plan goes out, out the window. <laughs> so what I try to do is get all the cherries uh, and then kill the creeps as I can, you know, uh, more defensively than, than offensively, I suppose. Um, now, after all the creeps have come out of the generator in the middle of the, the level, uh, the generator will turn into a bonus food item. And if you go get that food item, number one, you get a bunch of bonus points. But number two, it changes the game into a different mode. You can kind of think of it as um, eating the power pellets on Pac-Man. Uh, so when you eat the snack, what happens is the whole uh, game changes color. All the creeps that were on the level freeze. They're still deadly, but they won't move. They just freeze. And three alpha, well, an alpha monster and three blue creeps will appear. And these are much more aggressive than the normal creeps. Uh, and they're a little faster and they will immediately begin to chase you. Now, there's two ways to end this mode. Actually, there's three if you include dying. <laughs> um, so dying is a way to end that mode. Uh, the second way to end that mode is to kill all three creeps, um, at which point once all those creeps are killed, it will go back to the normal gaming mode. But the third thing, and what you really want to try to do, is kill the alpha monster, which is one of those five letters. And so when you kill the alpha monster, those blue creeps, the, the new creeps that have appeared, I know this sounds complicated, they will all disappear 
and it will go back to the other game mode. So if you're trying to get an extra man, that's the best way to do it is to get those um, wait, you know, till all the monsters are out, get the snack in the middle, turn it into the bonus time, and then try to shoot the letter before the creeps are able to kill you. Now the creeps will be chasing you. So you really, it's, you'll have to learn these techniques where you have to loop around and get behind the monsters that come up from behind them. Uh, it's not always easy to do, but uh, once you've played it a few times, you'll figure it out. Uh, according to the manual, cherries are worth 50 points each. And if you get all eight cherries, there is a 500 point bonus. So you definitely want to try to get, if you're getting cherries, try to get all eight without stopping. Uh, if you hit an enemy with the Powerball, that's 500 points. Crushing enemies with the apple is one of those exponential bonuses. So if you get one, it's 1,000 points. Two is 2,000, but three is 4,000. Um, after that, it's 6,000 and then 8,000. Uh, alpha monsters are worth 500 points. The diamond, as I mentioned before, which doesn't always appear. And I played this game... Uh, well, I don't know that I ever saw the diamond on the Commodore 64 version. I've seen it in the arcade, and it's still pretty rare. I mean, it might appear one out of every somewhere, you know, 15 to 20 games. So it doesn't happen very often. But I, I'm not sure that the diamond exists in the Commodore version. It may be there, but I never personally saw one. Uh, but if you do get a diamond, it's 8,000 points, and you get a free game. Uh, and then finally... Uh, those treats in the middle are worth a lot of points. Uh, the first level is uh, 1,000, and then the next one is 1,500, and then it's 2,000, and they go up uh, every level until it maxes out, I think, at 8,000 points. Uh, I looked online at computerscene.com for a high score, and the highest score, which it says is unverified, but there are screenshots, is uh, about 20 million, just over 20 million. 20 million, 50,450. Uh, my high score for play this week was about 30,000. <laughs> so um, you could have taken every game I played, every game of Mr. Dude I played all week long, and it would not have come anywhere near. I mean, add them all together. It wouldn't have come and multiply it by, uh, you know, 20,000. And if <laughs> it wouldn't have come close uh, to that high score. So kudos to that guy. That's all I got to say about that. Uh, I didn't find a lot of reviews out there, but uh, I looked at Lemon, and their their overall review is 8.2, which is pretty good. Zap Magazine gave it a 75 out of 100. Uh, it does look like the response was uh, generally positive. There were a few comments about some of the, the uh, movements being a little sluggish, and I... Uh, can attest to that. Um, it's not always easy if you're trying to make a quick maneuver to get Mr. Do to do Mr. Do to do what you want him to do. Uh, <laughs> but uh, um, I mean, as, as far as being a port of an arcade classic, it's, it's pretty good. You know, it's really not bad at all. Um, I found some different trivia uh, in regards to Mr. Do. And the first is that uh, very obviously, once if you play this game, uh, it was very obviously inspired by Dig Dug. Uh, it looks like Dig Dug. Um, you know, you drop apples instead of rocks. You're digging through the dirt just like in Dig Dug. And guys are chasing you. I mean, it's there's a lot more to this game than Dig Dug, but it's very, very similar. And uh, under the trivia, it said that the developer, the original developer of this game for Universal, was basically called into the office by management who said, give us a game that's like Dig Dug. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think he, he succeeded. Uh, now, Mr. Do is not a Dig Dug clone. There's, like I said, a lot more to this game uh, than regular Dig Dug, but, uh, but you can see that the games are similar. And, you know, it's one of those games, like if you took your, your mother or, you know, back in the day, maybe your grandmother to an arcade and showed them Mr. Do and Dig Dug, they would probably think those games are related. So uh, they do look pretty similar. Another trivia fact I found was that the uh, extra, the whole 
sub-game of collecting extra was inspired by Pinball. Again, the guy who developed the game was a big fan of Pinball, and he liked the fact that in Pinball games you could get an extra ball by scoring extra. Uh, so he uh, did that, and his other inspiration was the diamond and finding the diamond giving you a free game. Again, uh, just like pinball, how sometimes you can be awarded a free game, like at the end, if you get a match, something like that. So he took a lot of ideas that were common in pinball and put them into the game. Uh, now, um, let me, I've got a, I don't have a slide that's showing up, but uh, um, the other trivia. Uh, fact that was pointed out on our Discord uh, by uh, uh, Discord member Z9K9 is that uh, the levels are shaped like the numbers of the level. Now, the first level is shaped like a big D, uh, which I assume is supposed to be for Mr. Do. And actually, there's a D, and then off to the left is a little circle that kind of looks like an O. So it's um, looks like do, but written backwards. But starting with level two, the part of the maze that is carved out is a big number two. And, and on level three, it's level three. Once you see it, you will never unsee it. It seems so amazingly obvious. But uh, because the way that the game starts with Mr. Do and you immediately begin running and changing the path that you're running, uh, a lot of people don't seem to notice that. But uh, like I said, once you've seen it, you cannot unsee it for sure. Um, there were a lot of different ports of this game. Uh, if you're watching the video, I've got uh, versions for the Apple II, Atari 2600, the Atari home computers, and the MSX on display. And they all essentially look like Mr. Do with whatever limitations that those hardware platforms had. Uh, along with those, well, I'll just read the whole list. Uh, it was ported to the Apple II, the Atari 2600, the Atari 8-bit, the ColecoVision, the Game Boy, MSX, uh, PC-98, the Tommy Tudor. Uh, it later was released on the Super Nintendo, which is a pretty late release for porting uh, a direct port of Mr. Do, but it is on the Super Nintendo. And then it did appear later on the Wii Virtual Console. So there's lots of uh, different places where you can get Mr. Do. Uh, there were multiple Mr. Do sequels that appeared. Uh, the first was Mr. Do's Castle, which was an arcade release that also appeared on the Atari 2600, the Atari 5200, the Atari 8-bit computers, ColecoVision, C64, and MSX. Uh, next was Mr. Do's Wild Ride, which is a really fun game if you've never played it. It has a lot of uh, things in common with the the first Mr. Do, you know, as far as the fruit and things, but it takes place on a roller coaster track, which uh, is running around and you, you ride around this track and stuff. It's really fun. Uh, that is uh, only on the arcade and there is a port for the MSX. Now there is a, another sequel sometimes called Do Run Run and sometimes called Mr. Do Run Run. <laughs> uh, but either way, that's a cheesy name. Uh, Mr. Do Run Run was a arcade game that was ported to 16-bit computers, the Amiga, the Atari ST, and it did appear also on the MSX. Uh, and finally, later on the Neo Geo, there is a port uh, or an original game called Neo Mr. Do, which is similar to the original Mr. Do, but obviously with much uh, brighter and more colorful cartoon-like graphics. So um, it, it's uh, worth playing, but uh, all these have different gameplay mechanics. None of them are direct sequels. I mean, they all play differently, but uh, um, I'm, my favorite is probably the original Mr. Do followed by Mr. Do's uh, Wild Ride. Uh, I looked on eBay for copies of this, and I could not find any copies uh, that have previously sold. There's one currently for sale for the Commodore 64 listed for $129, which I think might be a dreaming price. Um, there are some other, there's a lot of copies for the ColecoVision and Atari 2600 and some of the other systems, but no uh, Commodore, Commodore versions available. Uh, now, let's talk a little bit about my personal memories of playing Mr. Do. All right, time travelers. Seatbelt fastened. Yes. Get you away to the past. Huh? Memories. 
I have memories of playing Mr. Do on the Commodore 64. Um, I would say it wasn't one of my favorite games, but only because I didn't fully understand how to play it. It seems like a game that you had to collect all the cherries to beat the level. That part of it seems obvious. But sometimes when you destroyed the monsters and a level would skip, you would be like, well, why did the level end? Or... You know, when it, you would get the bonus thing and it would throw into the bonus game and, and everything changed. Uh, it was very difficult to figure out what exactly was going on and all the nuances uh, of the game without having the instruction manual, which obviously, as a kid who downloaded this from a BBS, I did not have the instruction manual. Um, I looked at my original Commodore 64 set of discs uh, and I've scanned in all the labels and I wanted to find my copy and see what else was on that disc. But what I was um, surprised to find is that it's on disc number one. Now I had uh, about six, a little over 600, maybe 620, 630 floppy disks for the Commodore 64. And not only have I converted all those into D64 disc images to preserve them, but I've also physically scanned them in. Like I put every one of those on a flatbed scanner and scanned them in so I could keep, you know, the pictures of the labels and the discs themselves. Now, I didn't start numbering discs until I had about 20 or 30 discs worth of games. And that was about the point where I realized that I wouldn't be able to find stuff. You know, it was getting difficult to find specific games that I was looking for. And so that's when I started uh, a numbering system. And I used a program called Disk Filer to put all the games in a list that would that would store them in a, uh, a database that you could... Uh, I used to print it out, print it out on, on tractor feed paper every now and then. But uh, so the point of that is I didn't start numbering disks until I had about 30 disks. So it's not likely that this is the first an actual first disc that I ever had. In fact, I'm sure it's not. Um, but for whatever reason, when I started numbering, this was the first disc in the box and this got labeled as disc number one. So this game appears on disc number one, side number one of my collection. So I thought that was uh, uh, somewhat interesting. I think Mr. Doom, now that I've played it, and I played it a lot in MAME a couple of years ago, I was doing a, a MAME club and, and some friends of mine and I were playing uh, arcade games and, and having high score competitions and things like that. And, uh, you know, once you learn the nuances of Mr. Doom, it's a really, really fun game. It's really challenging. Um, and it's not just about getting to the highest level that you could get or reaching the highest level, but also getting as many points per level so that you could get those higher scores later on. Um, and the Commodore 64 version is not all that different from the arcade game. It plays a little bit slower. The controls are slightly uh, less responsive, but overall it's very, very similar game and uh, is definitely worth checking out. For graphics, I give Mr. Do four out of five creeps. Uh, for music, I also give it four out of five creeps. The music is uh, loyal to the arcade version and very good. Sound effects, it also gets four out of five creeps, so you may see where I'm going with this. Overall gameplay, I give Mr. Do four out of five creeps. This is a great home version of Mr. Do that is not quite arcade perfect, but it's still really fun and worth checking out. Thanks again for tuning in to Sprite Castle. If you have feedback about this or any episode of the show, you can email me directly at Rob O'Hara at RobOHara.com. Join the conversation on Facebook at Facebook.com forward slash Robcast. Almost forgot that. Follow me on Twitter at Commodore. Come chat with me on the Amigos Retro Gaming Discord or leave a message on my podcast hotline at 405-486-YDKF. 
All patron supporters of my shows get behind the scenes blog posts, weekly videos, access to the Amigos Retro Gaming Discord server, and other additional perks. To find out more, visit patreon.com forward slash Rob O'Hara. I'd like to give a personal shout out to all my Patreon supporters. For my 8 bit supporters, we have Alan Hennessy, Alan Hudgens, Armadon Restel, Brian Barr, Kerry Clanton, Chris Folds, C Dubs, Calbird Boy, Dan Paradroid Heavey, Darren Folds, Dave Velociraptor, David Chambers, David Hearn, David Modelak, Eric Stryanisi, Garrett Allier, Gary Heather, Graham Vebke, Jake Nonamaker. I'm scrolling and losing my place. <laughs> Jason Warrens, John Bodokar Schaller, John Treholt, Jose Cazada, Joshua Eckroth, Mark Alley, Mike McLaughlin, Mitsuyama, Mr. Bundy, Mr. Wacky, Nathan Dagenhart, Olaf Hope, Patrick Markey, Rydar, and Christopher Bow, Retro Trace, Rick Reynolds, Roy Jacobs, Scooter Prime, Scott Lambert, Scrap Arcade, Stephen Burt, Steve Rasmussen, The Slow Norris, Zeke Pabsky, Zerfall, and The Mysterious Cobra Kai. And I can't forget my 16-bit supporters. That's Boarheads Tavern BBS, Dan Creek, Dave Zilly, Edward Smith, John Morrison, Matt Nicholson, Scott Van Dracek, Steve Sharippa, and Vintage Volts. This episode of Sprite Kessel is proudly sponsored by Retro Rewind. For all your Commodore 64 bits, bytes, and accessories, visit Retro Rewind at RetroRewind.ca. You can use Sprite Kessel when checking out for a 10% discount on all orders. Sprite Kessel is available from iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, the RSS feed at podcast.robohara.com, and through the official Amigos podcast feed at anchor.fm forward slash Amigos podcast. You can now also watch the show on youtube.com forward slash Amigos retro gaming. To hear more podcasts from me like You Don't Know Flat, Cactus Flax, Throwback Reviews, and Multiple Sadness, visit podcast.robohara.com for links to these shows. Sprite Castle is available from iTunes, Spotify. Did I just read this? I think I just read this. Google Podcasts. I did. Uh, the RSS feed. Uh, you know where to get the show. <laughs> when you get slides uh, out of order and you're trying to do two things at once, it can scramble your brains. Many of the news articles and game details for Sprite Castle come from websites such as Commodore News, Indie Retro News, Vintage is the New Old, the Commodore Scene Database, Lemon64, and Moby Games. Thanks again for listening. Now get back to Smashing Creeps, and we'll see you here next time on Sprite Castle. <laughs>